Well, good morning and greetings. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Owen Taylor, and I have the pleasure of being the pastor here, and I'm glad that you are joining us for our time of worship here on this uh, ninth, ninth day of June. It is a beautiful day that we can gather together to worship our Lord and Savior. So uh, I always like to, to start our time off by thanking those who help make worship possible, from Tina, who is monitoring our Facebook page, to those who help pick out the hymns and help provide the resources for us to be able to come to you live on Facebook each Sunday. Um, if you happen to be joining us live or throughout the day, I invite you to, one, hit that like and share key if this message is speaking to you, and secondly, give us a shout out there in the comment box. Let us know that you're out there. Let us know what is going on in your lives, where you have seen God active in your lives, as well as those places where you need a little bit of extra prayer, because it is one of the ways that we can, can stay connected as the body of Christ. So let's go ahead and begin our worship time together this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. Lord, we welcome this day, having seen the miracles of everyday creation in our world. We've enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rains. We have marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of all of your creation. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us, that we may go forth from this place ready to joyfully serve you in everything that we do. We raise this prayer to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, this is Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Listen to these inspired words from Paul. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm made of flesh and blood, and I'm sold as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the things that I hate. But if I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing I don't want to do, then I'm not doing the one thing anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages war against the law in my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I'm a miserable human being. Who will ever deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then our gospel lesson this morning is our continuing journey through the gospel of Mark. And today we find ourselves in uh, chapter 12 and looking at verses, um, well, let's see, this is 18 through 27. So listen to these inspired words from Mark as we journey through what we understand as Holy Week. Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a, man, a man's brother dies, leaving a widow but no children, the brother must marry the widow and raise up, the, raise up children for his brother. 
Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman. When he died, he left no children. The second married her and died without leaving any children. The third did the same. None of the seven left any children. Finally, the woman died. At the resurrection, when they all rise up, whose wife will she be? All seven were married to her. Jesus said to them, Isn't this the reason you are wrong? Isn't the reason you are wrong because you don't know either the scriptures or God's power? When people rise from the dead, they won't marry, nor will they be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like God's angels. As for the resurrection from the dead, haven't you read in the scroll from Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Is it the God of the dead? He isn't the God of the dead, but of the living. You are seriously mistaken. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today we are continuing to explore the movements of God's grace that help us deal with the addictive, addictive behaviors that we face in life. Last week we defined addiction simply as the behaviors that are a result of the complex struggle between acting on impulses and resisting those impulses. We named that those addictions can come from, can be in the form of drug and alcohol abuse, or perhaps they're in socially acceptable behaviors like shopping, playing video games, or the use of social media when they're done in extremes. The key is, is that they affect our relationships with each other and with God. We also name that I am not a doctor or a therapist. I am a pastor. And our conversations surrounding addictions would be from a theological perspective of how to break free from the chains of addiction through our faith. With all of that in mind, this morning we have a powerful and profound message from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. In this section of Romans, Paul articulates a struggle that is familiar to all of us, that eternal battle between our desire to do good and our tendency to fall into sin. This passage speaks to the very core of our human existence of battling addictions, highlighting the conflict within us and pointing us towards the liberating power of God's grace. In these verses, Paul expresses his frustration and anguish over his inability to do what he knows is right. He writes, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm made of flesh and blood, and I'm sold as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing that I hate. Here, Paul is not speaking mere, merely from a theological standpoint. He's reflecting on a universal truth about our human condition. We've all experienced moments when we find ourselves doing what we know is wrong, despite our best intentions. You can fill in the blank. I know that I shouldn't eat cheeseburgers and fries three times a week or scroll on my phone hour after hour. These struggles of doing things we hate is particularly evident in the context of addictions, whether it be substances, behaviors, or even negative thought patterns. Addictions can be so insidious and powerful that so insidious and powerful. They start often very subtly, 
gradually gaining a foothold in our lives until they dominate our thoughts and actions. Our addictions make us feel trapped, as if we're sold to, to, as slaves to sin, to echo Paul's words. The behaviors we wish to avoid become compulsive, and despite our best efforts to resist, we find ourselves doing them again and again. This relentless struggle can lead to despair and a sense of hopelessness. We may begin to believe that we are beyond redemption, that our addictions actually define us, and that freedom is unattainable. However, Paul's message does not end with despair. Instead, he points us towards the source of hope and liberation. This hope from Paul is in verses 18 through 20. Listen to these words. I know that good doesn't live in me, that it's in my body. The desire to do good is inside me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not doing the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's that sin that lives in me that is doing it. What Paul is saying here is that the law, though holy and good, serves to reveal our shortcomings, our addictions. The law, the word of God, shows us what is right, but it does not provide us the power to overcome our sinful nature. This recognition of God's, of the law's limiting, the law's limitations is crucial. While the law can guide us and convict us of our sins, it cannot save us. Our salvation and freedom from bondage of sin and addiction comes from another source, the movement of God's justifying grace. Justifying grace is the movement of God's grace by which God pardons our sins and accepts us as righteous, meaning that we are brought into a right relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not something that we can earn or achieve on our own efforts. It's a gift, a gift that is freely given to us by God. And here's the thing, this grace is transformative, offering us a new identity and a fresh start. Let's go back to the text. Pick, starting with verses 24 and 25, Paul writes, I'm a miserable person. I'm a, let me try that again. I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here, Paul acknowledges his own helplessness and then immediately shifts to declaring a declaration of thanksgiving for the deliverance that is found in Christ Jesus. It is through Jesus' death on the cross, Christ's sacrificial love and resurrection, that we are rescued from the grip of sin and addiction. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are justified by faith. This means that God forgives our sins and sees us as righteous because of Christ's righteousness. This justice is not based on our ability to overcome our struggles on our own, but on Christ's victory over sin and death. Now, I know that this can sound like a one and done type thing. We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and, me, and we are made right with God forever. But it's not. Justifying grace is a significant and foundational movement within the broader process of our salvation 
that continues throughout our lives. We continue to see and feel this movement of God's grace, this justifying grace throughout our faith journey. Here's what I mean. When you start or end your day with prayer and you talk to God about those places where you've fallen short, those places where you've sinned, and you ask God for forgiveness and guidance, you are experiencing the movement of God's justifying grace. When you come to the communion table, you are reminded and are reminded through the words spoken over the table of Christ's sacrifice and how God's grace can renew your connection by the presence of Jesus in the gifts of bread and wine. That is a symbol of God's justifying grace. When you attend a small group meeting, like a Bible study, and you and the other members of the group share the struggles that you face and where you've seen God's, God's work in your lives, this is a reaffirmation of that justifying grace that you've experienced. It helps us stay grounded in our faith and encourages our spiritual growth. When you come and participate in worship by singing hymns and hearing the word preach and engaging in communal prayer, these actions reinforce the assurance of God's love and forgiveness for you. They open you up to exploring God's justifying grace. When you're in the grocery store and you put some extra items in your cart for wheat, you're allowing God's love and grace to work through you. This act and the other acts of service remind you of the grace that you have been freely given and received, and they reinforce your commitment to live a life of faith by serving others. And when you get into a conversation about your faith with the people around you, and then you tell them your faith story, your story of experiencing God's grace and forgiveness, you're actually reminding yourself of where you've come from and how God's justifying grace has transformed your life. Friends, in Christ, we find strength to break free from the chains of addiction that are in our lives. This doesn't mean that the struggle will disappear overnight or that we'll never face temptation again. No, rather it means that we have access to a power greater than our own, a power that enables us to resist temptation, to seek help and to find support within the faith community. As we embrace this movement of justifying grace, we are called to live into a new identity in Christ. This involves a commitment to turning away from the old patterns of sin and addiction and turning to a new life that God offers us. It's a process of ongoing transformation supported by the means of grace that God has provided. It's important to remember that asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but a recognition of our need for God's grace, for God's help, and the support of others. In fact, it's an act of humility and faith, acknowledging that we can't do it alone and that we trust in God's provision for our recovery. You know, last week, I encouraged you to spend some time examining your life, looking for actions and behaviors that you have that were getting in the way of your relationships, how they were hurting you, your family, your friends, and how they were coming between you and God. This week, I have other challenges or encouragements for you to try. I encourage you to talk to God about those places that you named last week. And if you haven't already, ask God for forgiveness and guidance 
in being set free from them. And then the other part of the challenge for you this week is to reflect on how you have experienced God's love in your life. Think back over your faith journey. When was that first time you remembered feeling that God loved you? When was the last time that you felt like you were loved by God? If you don't ever think you felt that feeling, or if it's been a long time ago and you're in a valley of dry bones, perhaps start praying to God to open your mind and your spirit. Maybe talk to a close friend about what you're experiencing and then pray together. You know, sometimes it just takes a close friend's point of view to point out the obvious things that you can't see. Then ask yourself and truly answer those hard questions. Questions like, what areas of my life do I need repentance and transformation? How do I handle the feelings of guilt and shame that I have because of the things that I have done? And how do I allow God's grace to bring me healing and renewal? Struggle with addictions is real. And the good news is that healing and renewal in our lives is possible because of God's justifying grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are empowered to break free from the chains of addictions to our lives and to ref and live lives that reflect love and holiness of God. Friends, this journey may be challenging, but it is also filled with the promise of new life and the assurance of God's unwavering presence with us. Well, remember, all things are possible with God's help. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, I hope you've enjoyed our time together. If you have, I invite you to hit the like and share key. Uh, but for now, let's, uh, let's get ready to take on the world. Let's get ready to take on the week and head out from this space. Receive this benediction. With God's help, we can break free from whatever chains that bind us. Friends, go with the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go oh, in peace, y'all. Bye for now.